Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Today's program is Autism and the Transgender Community. But before I begin, I'm Keith Halperin, and I'd like to ask our co-host, uh, Will Burnick, what's with your shirt? Funny you, sh funny you should ask that. My last shirt for, of the season is my neurodiversity shirt. It represents autism and, and diversity, diversity in the world. I got it from the ARC. It's my favorite shirt. I wear it all the time. <laughs> really, really good. Today's guest is uh, Tracy Garza, community activist. Will, would you like to begin? Sure. Tell Tracy, tell us about how about your background and how you got involved with the aut with with the autism community. Well, thank you very much for ha having me first. Um, and uh, you know, I've been living in San Francisco for about seventeen years now. And I only started really becoming um, more informed about neurodiversity and spectrum issues specifically about seven or six, I'd say six or seven years ago. And I've been trying to get a little bit more involved over time uh, because at first I was a little, you know, I, I felt like, you know, there was so much stuff I didn't know myself. And so it's been kind of, uh, you know, a learning experience and I think it's um, it's it's an area where I think there's probably room for more activism than there has been in the past. Uh, I see some uh, interesting parallels between other uh, movements, you know, for uh, other other types of civil rights movements and the uh, neurodiversity movement. And I think uh, you know there's so much more that that potentially could be done uh, for and uh, on behalf of our community. Tell us now. Tell us about how how you're involved with the transgendered with the transgendered community. Well, um, I have been doing activism on and off uh, for the most you know most of the last seventeen years, and a lot of that has been LGBT activism. And you know, one of the things that really struck me as you know really fascinating was uh, you know coming to the realization after you know analyzing and looking at a lot of um, academic research that there's a pretty uh, significant overlap between the gender uh, diverse community and the neurodiverse community. Uh, we have established that this overlap exists. Uh, scientists have not been able to give a reason why. Uh, the best we can, you know, our best educated guess is that all of this has to do with, you know, uh, the way that the brains are wired. And more specifically than that, I, I don't think we can say really at this point, you know, why there, there should be an overlap that's you know statistically very very significant. When you look at the general population, uh, autism autism spectrum disorders are ex are uh, estimated to affect maybe roughly one percent of the population, give or take. And when you look at the trans community, it's much closer to ten to twenty percent. So it's ten to twenty times more likely to occur uh, among people who are trans or gender non-conforming than in the general population. And this overlap is. It's really, really, you know, unique. I, I really don't think, uh, you know, we've ever seen uh, something that brings together disability rights and LGBT rights uh, into one single, um, you know, unique overlap uh, in any time, any time in the past. Uh, and I think that, unfortunately, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, you see there's a lot of lack of awareness uh, about this uh, within LGBT circles, unfortunately. And I think we should do a little bit more to try to build bridges between, you know, the, uh, you know, the LGBT community and the, and the disability community, especially in regards to this. Mm -hmm. And now tell us about your advocacy. Well, one of the things that I have been working on very passionately over the last few months. And, you know, this is something that's probably going to be, you know, probably years in the making. Uh, but I would like to see uh, the city of San Francisco implement a series of policy and uh, uh, the departmental uh, decisions that could, in the short term, um, maybe within the next, you know, two or three years, make San Francisco the most autistic friendly city in the whole United States, possibly even in the whole world. 
I think it is very befitting for a city that's been very, you know, long known for its, uh, you know, progressive politics uh, to do something, to do as much as can be done. Because I think, uh, based on my experiences and the experiences of many people I know uh, in the autistic community, um, I think there's still a, uh, you know, significant uh, lack of resources in some in some areas. There's a big gap in the in the safety net that might otherwise, you know, make people's lives a little bit easier to make you know certain challenges a little bit easier to overcome. And when you look at it, you know, the city of San Francisco has a budget of nearly ten billion dollars a year. That's billion with a B. And there's a lot that probably could be done uh, on behalf of the autistic community, whether it's through grants uh, or or you know funding a specific. Uh, programs or projects uh, right now as of the last year or so I know that the city of San Francisco was uh, channeling about half a million dollars towards uh, transgender organizations and organizations that serve the trans community so just think how much good you could do with half a million dollars or even less than that you know for any other cause and naturally this is not the kind of thing that happens overnight uh, it takes usually many years of advocacy uh, it takes a, you know, really kind of a community-wide effort to try to, you know, bring this, come, uh, make this, you know, come to fruition. Uh, but I think that the long-term benefits uh, would definitely make this more than worthwhile. I think we could look at, you know, some significant uh, policy changes and, you know, the, the implementation of more citywide policies and programs that could affect uh, people's lives in a very positive way. Uh, you know, spe spe specifically for folks that maybe uh, for whom the safety net hasn't always been um, as secure or as strong as they would have probably, you know, uh, what they could have, you know, really used in terms of support. So we're looking at, you know, what we can do, uh, talking with the Human Rights Commission here in San Francisco, the Department of Public Health and other organizations, uh, as you're already aware, there's at least a couple of city agencies that have already implemented some kind of program like uh, the SFPD, which has worked with the SEND in, in the recent past. So what we want to look at is, you know, how do we make this uh, encompass the whole city, all the departments and all of the organizations that uh, serve a purpose in city government to make sure that there's no single part of the city government that's not aware of and trying to be sensitive towards uh, the needs of people on the spectrum. Could you tell us typically what your advocacy involves, Tracy? What do you do in the course of uh, performing it? Well, advocacy, I like to think, comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, for example, one of the things I've been doing for about six years now, um, I've been a member of the LGBT Advisory Committee of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. And this is a citizen-led uh, group um, that meets at least once a month. And we also have a few individual work groups so that means I'm not an employee of the city. I'm, you know, I have no financial ties to, to the city of, of San Francisco. It's just that, you know, we come together and we try to look at, you know, see uh, issues that are going on is in the city that affect, you know, parts of this uh, of the LGBT community. I have been a big advocate of trying to look at uh, neurodiversity as very much an LGBT issue, even though before me, I don't think anybody had ever mentioned this in in any kind of. Um, LGBT-led discussion. Oh, could you tell us more about that? Well, the thing is that you have to realize that what we now know about the overlap between uh, gender diversity and neurodiversity, we've only known for about six or seven years, even though, you know, as far as we can tell, you know, it's probably always been there. We just didn't know that it was there and people didn't know what to look for. And so because of that, uh, for a lot of LGBT organizations, this is kind of a new thing. It's not something they're familiar with. Other issues that have, you know, to do with health, they've been dealing mm -hmm. with for decades. You know, HIV issues, they've had to deal with that for many decades. And But when it comes to this, this is still fairly new for a lot of LGBT folks. And so many of them are confused or, or they don't understand. And to compound the situation, uh, there's also significant evidence that even many medical professionals are not as aware or informed about this um, as they probably would be or should be. I know somebody who works in the Department of Public Health here in San Francisco, and she was telling a group of us during a, a public meeting the other day that I don't even remember the percentage. It could have been maybe 70 or 80 percent, but the, the huge majority of people who go to medical school 
actually never have to like go into autist autistic issues very much you know in 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 very much detail they don't they don't have to learn a lot about it they don't have to uh, understand a lot about it so even within the medical community sometimes there's not in enough awareness about you know what what the issues are and why you know they can have a a, a disparate effect uh, on the health outcomes affecting people on the spectrum um so this is one of the things that definitely we probably should look at and work with clinics uh, and, and physicians in the in the San Francisco area, because you know s historically San Francisco has had a higher percentage of the population who identify as trans or gender nonconforming, which means that there's probably also a greater number of people on the spectrum, uh, statistically speaking, in San Francisco than you might expect to see in another big city of the similar of mm -hmm. a similar size, and because of that. Um, and and also I should mention that mm -hmm. it's estimated that possibly as, as many as 10% of homeless people may also be on the spectrum. Again, this is versus 1% in general population studies. So what this means is that there's several reasons to think that, uh, you know, there might be more people on the spectrum living in San Francisco than you would expect in any other city of the same size. Mm -hmm. And that's why it makes it so much more important to have greater awareness to have programs that uh, that address the needs of people on the spectrum, um, you know, some kind of policy making, uh, or maybe you know, some maybe forming a task force at some point. Uh, but the larger point here is that, whereas in the trans community, for example, you have maybe 20 to 25 years of uh, you know solid activism, uh, you know, going out and talking to public officials. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, we don't have that. We haven't yet reached that point uh, in the autistic community, which is something that I think we can look forward to because I think we could make um, a lot of progress by being more diligent about talking to city leaders, talking talking to the elected officials. The elected officials should be there for everyone in who lives in San Francisco. You know, they're paid with uh, you know the tax dollars that are raised by the city. So they are, in a, in a sense, our employees, you know, all of us who, who are residents of San Francisco are helping to pay for their salaries, are helping to pay for city programs. And therefore, you know, there's some accountability that goes with that. So if we, if we go to them, if we go to the board of supervisors or elected officials uh, or the mayor's office and say, you know, is, is there something you can do for our community? Then they definitely, you know, should be looking at this and trying to, like, you know, figure out, you know, work with us to see what we can come up with, what specific programs or things we can look at to supplement uh, whatever safety net is there to begin with, which I think most people don't think is sufficient for for the needs because the needs of our community um, are so deep, and I know a lot of people who have struggled even even in a progressive city like San Francisco. Uh, because they haven't always been able to find the, the support that they needed. And I think this is one of the things we need to absolutely work on, uh, get more familiarized with, you know, how do you lobby uh, as a group of individuals? You know, how do you go and knock on the doors of, uh, you know, the supervisors, you know, who are at City Hall? You can go, request a meeting, and then present your, uh, you know, suggestions or concerns or needs uh, in the next few months. Uh, the city, uh, the city's uh, human rights commission is going to also be looking at some of these, you know, concerns. And so I'm kind of hopeful because we've already had the director of the human rights commission come to a meeting at the, uh, you know, at the ascend monthly meeting and, and address some of uh, some of our concerns and address things like how do you deal with discrimination? How and when can you file a complaint? What resources do you have if you feel you have been treated unfairly because you're on the spectrum or if you feel that you have an employer who has been insensitive or maybe even, you know, ableist or, you know, has be, has discriminated against you maybe in some way. So all of these things are um, areas in which the city can help and has, you know, in some cases, a significant amount of leverage. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Stacey Kennedy, you have a question. Oh, uh, yeah. I just, I, well, I did have one, but um, I, I think I, I guess I have more of a comment now. I... Um, Shoot, sorry, a little mm -hmm. got blanked for a second, but I um, definitely um, appreciate you sharing all this. I, I, I guess my uh, my comment is is that I, I feel that yeah, the more open that this community or city is, the the less issues there will be. You know, it, you know, I mean, those I don't know, they just seem to have like I don't want to say normal life or so, but they seem you know like 
oh, they're just walking to work and stuff like that. And they see someone on the streets and it's like, oh, you have issues. Well, it's like, well, you're not listening, you know, that type of thing. I mean, it definitely with those, uh, I mean, definitely be in touch with those um, who advocate and who are, who uh, specialize, especially in the medical um, mm -hmm. field with that. Um, they, they, sh they, they should definitely be, be more open mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. I just, I'd say, yeah, the more open, the, the, the less like issues and more, um, um, even funding that they can mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. okay Ken if you had a comment or a question well I just want to know compared to the situation mm -hmm. 10 or 20 years ago do you feel like any progress has been made has anything changed in what sense in the sense of the autistic community well I guess in the sense of other people's understanding of autism and services available for people on the spectrum? Well, um, I, I'd like to think that we haven't seen as much change as we probably should uh, or as we could eventually get to see. Uh, for example, um, I am not aware right now of, um, you know, any elected officials who are openly autistic, who are in a prominent position in the government. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that at some point, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see a change in that. Uh, for example, in San Francisco, we have had uh, department heads who have been openly transgender, and we have had some commissioners who have been openly transgender, but we, to the best of my knowledge, we have not seen openly autistic uh, commissioners serving the city, openly autistic department heads, uh, the people who report directly to the mayor, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I mm -hmm. think we should see because we need to be represented and we need to make sure that mm -hmm. our issues are not going to get lost. And again, you know, San Francisco has a ridiculously good reputation for mm -hmm. being a progressive city. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, time progressive to progressive for some, but I exactly. feel like those of us on the spectrum are yeah. in the position that the homosexual community was back in 1969 when Stonewall happened. Right. How mm. much longer do we have to wait? It's a good point, and that's why we need to work mm -hmm. hard. And uh, have you met? Uh, is there anyone you've met who is just as loyal as you to the situation? Well. I mean, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, I do know at least uh, one person who is, uh, you know, working for, for the DPH who seems to have a pretty solid grasp on, you know, why these issues are important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it, it needs to be, you know, unfortunately, this is kind of the thing that, you know, maybe for some of us, maybe we'd like not to be reminded about, but we need to remem remind yes. public officials about the disparity in health outcomes when it comes to folks in the spectrum. Yeah. Earlier on, you had talked about uh, how you were working on some initiatives to help make uh, San Francisco perhaps the mm -hmm. most uh, autistic-friendly community in the United States, if not the world. Could you tell us what those policies would be and, if implemented, how they would make the lives of the typical community member better? Well, gladly. Um, I think we already have seen some precedents for this. Um, I mentioned the uh, work that Ascend did with the SFPD. So we could do something similar with a lot of agencies, uh, agencies where, uh, you know, a government official interacts with the public. Uh, we would like to see, you know, greater awareness of all the people who interact with public uh, for any number of government paperwork or whatever, uh, clinics that serve the community. Uh, we could, you know, uh, build awareness among medical professionals and everybody who is uh, interacting with the public. Uh, one thing we've seen with some tech companies is having uh, job programs that specifically uh, make better use whenever possible of the strengths that, you know, people on the, on the spectrum can bring to a situation. And I think we should see that happening possibly also in some government agencies where, you know, they would have a program to try to make it, uh, you know, more obvious and, 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 and you know, show greater... Uh, uh, interest in bringing people uh, on the spectrum into positions that you know that will you know be ma make them more a part of the community and make them you know interact more with you know everyday uh, everyday folks every everyday fo uh, residents of San Francisco. Uh, it's also possible that we could have something that's a little similar to s some of the stuff that LGBT organizations already do in terms of having drop-in centers where people could come in, uh, say, during the week, uh, you know, weekdays and get referrals if they if they have specific needs uh, in regards to, you know, maybe uh, health care or, you know, job referrals or any other thing or if they have any 
complications uh, using public accommodations, if they have trouble with their housing, with an unsupportive landlord or neighbors who, or any other, on any other problem that's a direct consequence of being uh, you know, a person with a disability, with uh, being a person on the spectrum, to have somebody who can help guide them and provide some support and you know, tell them you know, what, what resources are available to them. Uh, we've seen something like that happening already uh, with some LGBT groups and some clinics that um, mm -hmm. specifically serve the LGBT community. I think we can do that very easily. Excellent. Big question then on that. Where would the funding come from for these programs? Well, like I said before, the city has a pretty humongous budget, $10 billion. That's mm. probably lar a larger budget than some of the smaller states in the U.S. Um, and, and, and besides, you know, there's always the possibility of having some program where, you know, some of the tech giants, uh, you know, come in and try to, you know, do something, provide maybe a little bit of funding or, you know, do some kind of uh, provide resources that they, that they can offer easily. Uh, so I think that between the city and some of the bigger companies that are doing business here in San Francisco that have a headquarters here in San Francisco, I think there should be ample resources to do this kind of thing. We've seen this happen with the LGBT community already. Like I said before, you know, half a million dollars a year to fund uh, organizations that help trans people. And that, you know, obviously is gonna be channeled through a number of organizations, but in the end, what we see there is, you know, the government trying to be responsive to the needs of the people who live in San Francisco. Excellent, thank you. Well, you have another question. What are your, what are your plans for working with students with autism? Well, um, I haven't really been very involved with the education process, but I think this is one of the things we can look at specifically in terms of talking to people from the uh, education board and trying to see, you know, what, you know, if if there's any any areas where we can, you know, do more stuff, you know, have maybe better programs or, or build more awareness uh, among the among the student population here. Um, also, on a more individual basis, I have been working on something that. I think it's still on the starting, you know, on the planning stage at this point, and that has to do with uh, a new coping technique that I have been developing. That, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think um, I don't think I've read anything of anything similar happening uh, or being done. So those are some areas that I'd like to work on. How can our viewers, if they're interested in becoming advocates either here or where they may reside, contact you to learn more about becoming a community advocate? Well, um, I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, get emails from anybody who might be interested. Um, my email is tracy.garza at gmail.com. And I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my handle on Twitter is at Tracy Garza. So that's easy to remember. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Tracy Garcia. You have been uh, phenomenally, highly articulate and, mm -hmm. and very uplifting to our community members. And we know we're going to hear a lot more good things mm -hmm. coming from you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And now our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks, will give us uh, her latest review. Thank you, Keith. The book today is called Mockingbird. It's a children's book. It won a National Book Award. And it's important for both children and adults to read this because it features something rarely seen in either children's or adult literature, a protagonist with Asperger's syndrome. I'd like to read you some of what the author has to say. This book was inspired by the events at Virginia Tech, as well as my own need to try to explain what it's like for a child to have Asperger's syndrome. The two themes are related in my mind because I believe strongly in early intervention, whatever the disability. Understanding people's difficulties and, just as crucial, helping people understand their own difficulties and teaching them concrete ways to help themselves will help them better deal with their own lives and, in turn, ours. In this novel, the main character has Asperger's syndrome but is receiving early intervention through the public school system. She has only one parent, and he is far from perfect. Her brother was the family member who really listened to her, tried to understand her, and taught her helpful behavioral skills. Unfortunately, he is killed in a school shooting, and now, but for her school counselor, she is on her own. I hope that by getting inside her head, 
readers will understand seemingly bizarre behavior. And I hope that readers will see that by getting inside someone's head, really understanding that person, so many misunderstandings and problems can be avoided. Misunderstandings and problems that can lead to mounting frustration and sometimes even violence. And what's even more astonishing is that this was written in 2010, before wow. Sandy Hook, before Orlando, before Las Vegas, before Sutherland Springs. Really interesting. Thank yes, you. Very powerful. And now our cultural correspondent, Stacy Kennedy. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to share is, um, okay, so Saturday, December 23rd, and Tuesday, December 26th, the AMC Sensory Friendly Film um, event is going to show Star Wars The Last Jedi. And from some, like, as I mentioned before, sometimes the times vary and the location of the AMC theater. So go to www.amctheaters.com slash programs slash sensory. Uh, different slash <laughs> friendly films. <laughs> so, any, so again, Saturday, December 23rd and Tuesday, December 26th, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. Sat. And just a reminder for um, sat on every Saturday, um, there's a Dance for All inclusive exercise class from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, on El Camino. It's I don't. It's not actually in El Camino Real, but um, the street's called El Camino. Camino. It's YMCA uh, 241. Excuse me, 2400 Grant Road in Mountain View, California. Um, and, and again, it's an environment um, that's safe and acceptive of people, and um, differences are definitely welcomed and without judgment and special needs participants. You can bring a family member or friends. There's also Pilates along with this um, dance class you could take, too. And for more information on that, go to www.ym. I think this is meant to be ymca.org or so. But anyhow, every Saturday, again, a Dance for All inclusive exercise in Mountain View. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Well, folks, this is our final program for 2017. I'm Keith Alperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacy Kennedy. I'm Tracy Garza. I'm Jennifer Brooks. And wishing you, as part of the autistic community, or friends, or family, or caretakers, or any relation thereof, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. See you next year. Happy holidays. See you in 2018.